Hi guys. Uh, so thank you so much for coming to this talk about OWASP dependency track and uh, fortifying the software supply chain. Uh, I'm Arvind. Like Stram mentioned, I'm a, a senior software engineer at Camp Systems and recently started diving into the AppSec world. And I'm also a contributor to dependency track. So uh, as we all know, uh, enterprise software relies heavily on third party libraries, right? And be it open source, closed source, or whatever. And that is really good because it helps uh, people avoid reinventing the wheel, uh, beat the competition with time to market and stuff like that. And uh, as you can see, this uh, stats is from the synopsis, uh, open source security and risk report from 2024 uh, is shows the pervasiveness of open source libraries. And uh, that is generally good. But on the flip side, we have another set of stats, right? It's from the same synopsis report. And it sounds like it's a downside of open source libraries, right? And the vulnerabilities here that they mentioned may not be just the direct vulnerabilities uh, in your project. It could also be transitives and uh, other sorts of vulnerabilities coming in from uh, the open source libraries that you use. And 53% also contain license conflicts, which means that uh, you're using open source libraries in a way that is non-compliant with the license that is uh, applied to, right? Like, like some licenses uh, may not be as permissive and requires you to, say, make the source code of your enterprise application available if you're using that open source library. Um, so these are some of the stats that I saw, and even more, uh, <coughs> excuse me, even more interesting were two specific numbers that I saw on the report, and that is this guy, which is 91% of the code bases that they surveyed in their uh, report had components that were 10 or more versions behind the current version of that software library. That is insane, right? And Equally insane is the mean age of vulnerabilities. So this shows that a vulnerability remains in your code for 2.8 years in average. So that means that either they are not aware that there is a vulnerability or they have just not gotten to uh, fixing that particular uh, vulnerability. And same thing, uh, which is putting things more into context, is 29% of log4j downloads ever since December 15, 2021 have been of the vulnerable version, right? And this is from uh, Sonatype's State of Software uh, Supply Chain Report. I highly recommend reading both these reports. They are pretty well made. Uh, so 29% means approximately 75 million downloads of log4j were of the vulnerable log4j version even after the uh, patch was released. Why we can never be sure. Maybe they're just using it for, you know, education. But uh, this is the reality. So um, what do we do now, right? Like, wh where do we go? If uh, one of the golden tenets of infosec or cybersecurity is you can't protect what you don't know. So we need to know our threat landscape. Uh, what is our uh, exposure, right? So if only we had a complete and accurate inventory of components, something like this guy, right? Uh, we're seeing used to this uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. And I'm sure as many of you might already be knowing where I'm going with this, um, this the answer to this is bill of materials. And specifically, if you're looking at the software side of things, is the software bill of materials or SBOM. And we're gonna be talking about a little bit about Cyclone DX which is a flagship OWASP project, and it provides a full stack spec of uh, software bill of materials and other bill of materials, like if you're buying a SaaS product from a SaaS vendor, you could ask them to provide a SaaS bomb, or there's also a hardware bill of materials and operations bill of material. And uh, Cyclone DX and s bombs in general have become quite mainstream, especially after uh, the U.S. executive order of the Biden administration um, in September 2021, I guess. And even uh, in the U EU, the Cyber Resilience Act has also uh, given more importance to uh, companies creating S-bombs and sharing S-bombs uh, with their users and suppliers. 
So just to give a quick overview of uh, Cyclone DX, Cyclone DX is a standard spec which lets, uh, which can be shared in like JSON, XML, or protobuf formats. Uh, it has certain sections. Um, it can have metadata, like who created the Cyclone DX S bomb, uh, who's the intended supplier, the manufacturer, and then it has the actual components themselves. Uh, where is the component present? Where is the evidence? The services, like which external API calls are you using? What are the endpoints? The relationships between these components and the services and the compositions. And similarly, there's many other sections in the Cyclone DX spec. I urge you to look at cyclonedx.org, uh, which has a, a complete uh, information about the spec for creating bill of materials. You can also include optionally the vulnerabilities within uh, the SBOM itself, or you could have it separate uh, in the form of a VEX or a VDR, which is a vulnerability disclosure report or a vulnerability exploitability exchange. And that really helps if, let's say, you're exchanging SBOMs with your supplier or you're buying a product from your, from a company. Uh, it helps if you have a definitive list of these are the vulnerabilities that uh, is there in my product. And this is why it does not have an impact, or this is what we are going to do about it, right? So it's a disclosure report, like right? that's the BDR. And yes, so bill of materials helps us with the problem of not knowing what we have in our in our system, right? But where do we go from there? Like you have a document, you have a software bill of materials. What do you want to do about it? That's where OWASP dependency track comes into picture. So it, it is a flagship OWASP project created by Steve Springett in 2013, and it's a software that helps you operationalize SBOMs. So in dependency track, you can ingest software bill of materials, and it is continuously analyzing the components and services inside the SBOM for known vulnerabilities and also uh, does continuous analysis, right? It's not just a one-shot ingest it and forget about it thing, it, because the vulnerability landscape of components are ever-changing. So you need to keep on checking whether uh, inventory has vulnerabilities or not. And it's enterprise-ready. It has features like SSO and uh, access management, and it's heavily API-driven. So if you have in your company other services or other products that uh, do the same thing, you could easily integrate uh, dependency track with it. And it's very ideal to use in your CICD, and helps you essentially give a full stack inventory, right? And the main highlight of dependency track is it helps uh, identify vulnerable components so that you can reduce your cyber risk. And we have integrations with multiple uh, vulnerability intelligence sources, as you can see. And also, um, once you do find vulnerabilities, you can get alerted through popular um, collaboration tools and webhooks. You can create your own notification channels. There's also uh, support for EPSS, the Exploit Prediction Scoring System, which helps you uh, prioritize which vulnerabilities to uh, tackle first. And another uh, strong feature of dependency track is the policy engine. So let's say you want to ensure that in your company nobody uses uh, packages that are older than three years or packages where the major version distance is not beyond a certain number, right? That's that's the problem we saw in the first slide where 10 plus <laughs> versions were behind for components. So you can add a policy that will immediately check across your entire application portfolio where um, and lets you know about it as uh, failures or warnings. Right, so in a, in a nutshell, dependency track can help answer the question of what is affected in my system or in my company and where is it affected, right? So it's a very efficient tool that uh, helps you reduce the time to find issues and identify and you can proactively take uh, mitigation steps towards it. So yes, and also, Dependency Track is the winner of the OWASP, uh, I mean, the SANS open source tool of the year. And yeah, that's a really good testament to all the great work put behind the project by the community. So enough talk. I'm going to quickly show a few demos of Dependency Track in action. Sorry. 
Let me just say play. So here we have the dependency track dashboard, which gives a really high level view of all the projects, all the components in your uh, application portfolio. Nice time series metrics. Uh, you can see uh, how many are vulnerable, how many projects are vulnerable, how many components are there. And you can also now go into uh, each of the projects. You can view the different projects in dependency track. It gives a uh, indication of the vulnerabilities and the policy violations as well. And if you go into a project, you see a similar dashboard, similar time series metrics about uh, the vulnerabilities throughout the age of this project. And uh, once we import or upload an SBOM into this project, you can see uh, inventory of all of the components present here, right? And this provides a good view about any dependency, not just your direct top-level dependencies, but also your transitives. So let's, uh, you can also provide uh, means to download SOM from dependency track also, along with the vulnerabilities ingested. There's also a neat feature called the dependency graph, where you can drill down into each and every dependency and see where uh, it is coming from, or it's a very neat tool to visualize your uh, transitive dependency along the whole dependency tree, right? The small triangle indicates that it is an outdated version. There is a new version available, so maybe you, you want to upgrade. And this is really the meat and potatoes of dependency track. This page shows which components are vulnerable, what are the CVEs affected to it, and what can you do about it too. Right, so let's uh, go ahead. There's a lot of um, components that have criticals and highs here. Let's say you want to see more details, you can uh, go into the component and it gives you information from the vulnerability sources that we have configured. Let's say you do not think that this uh, component is vulnerable in your system because it's not in a reachable stage. So, uh, oops. You could also essentially suppress that vulnerability, specific that vulnerability, and you can also add uh, reasoning to it, like this vulnerability was not uh, highly uh, affected here because the code for this vulnerability is not reachable, so I can mark that uh, component as suppressed. Let me just go a little forward. Yep, so here you can see uh, the analysis state. It's been marked as not affected. And all of this information is logged, so you know who did this and uh, what was the reasoning behind it. So you could see on the audit trail that this, code, uh, this vulnerability is suppressed because the code was not reachable. So this is a pretty um, handy tool in case you have false positives, right? You don't want to mess up your metrics just because there are a few pos false positives. Um, and yep, so these are, this is the audit vulnerabilities view. And the next uh, view that we're going to look at is going to be the exploit predictions. So this is more of the EPSS score, which helps you, um, you know, prioritize based on the exploitability of the CVEs identified. And we also have a page for the policy violations. So these policies have been set up in the policy setup page, and you can see um, which components are failing the, the conditions that you have set up. And this is totally automated. You can see there's a policy for package age greater than two years. So these, and that's not really a fail, it's an info. So you can decide which policies are critical to your organization or not, right? You can also go into a co specific component and view the vulnerabilities affecting that specific component, right? So all the CVEs that are uh, per component. And you can also go into the CVE and do the opposite. You can see all the projects that are uh, impacted by a CVE. You get pretty neat views about the CVSS score um, and also the OAuth risk rating if it's available for that uh, CVE. And you can also see um, the affected components. The really helpful factor for me was the affected projects page, right? Think of how uh, 
helpful this would have been if uh, you were triaging log4j in your entire uh, organization, right? You can just go into the CVE for log4shell and quickly see all of the projects, all of the uh, teams that need to do work on remediating log4shell. So this page is uh, very useful, helps reduce uh, triaging time. And yep, so this is uh, the vulnerabilities uh, page. There's also a relatively new feature called the vulnerability audit. It's more of a slice and dice kind of dashboard where you can filter out um, CVEs for your projects based on multiple filters. And you can also specify the date ranges and um, CVSS scores that you're uh, interested in. So it provides, like as you can see, there's a lot of uh, views in dependency track that helps uh, you identify risks. So another page is where you can search for a component by uh, a component name, and you can go inside a component and view uh, whether it's uh, affected or not. Yep. And like we mentioned, we also want to know about licenses, right? So there's a page that shows all of the available licenses, their SPDX license IDs. It's a pretty neat view. And this is where you actually set up the policies. So here you can see there are some policies already set up and right off of the box you get certain conditions such as uh, package age, major version distance, and uh, vulnerability, or you can also add uh, hashes of known malicious packages so that in case it is introduced into your uh, application portfolio, the policy itself will take care of it and uh, flag it for your review. So this is just uh, out of the box uh, conditions. There's also, I'm going to be showing another very powerful feature called the policy uh, analysis that is coming up in the new version of dependency track. Uh, let's continue. Yep, so here we have set up a policy for package age and let's say you, you don't want anybody in your organization to use Angular less than version 12. So you can also control that through uh, policies in dependency track. And yeah, so th this is uh, providing policies based on severity. So in uh, dependency track is very enterprise ready, so it's highly configurable, right? So you can set up how often does dependency track scan for issues. Um, it runs periodically, you can set up the time. And there's also multiple analyzers like the NBD, there's one DB, and uh, you can, if you have a sneak membership, you can add your sneak details as well, and also trivi. And similarly, we have a bunch of vulnerability sources, like uh, the NVD is the default one. You can also integrate uh, GitHub security advisories and also Google OSV. So you can ensure that you're getting information from all of the authoritative sources. Similarly, let's say in your organization, you're using packages that are internal uh, to your company. It's not publicly available. So you can create uh, repositories that are uh, authenticated. And also, there's means to set up notification alerts uh, as soon as you get vulnerabilities or when, let's say, the bomb processing failed, you can get an email or get notifications and uh, stuff like that. So, yes, this is where you can also... Uh, connect SSO to um, dependency track and manage teams by restricting their access within dependency track itself. So what we just saw was a very high level view of uh, dependency track. Um, so there's a, a sneak peek into uh, the latest development in dependency track called Project Hades. So Hades is dependency track re-architected for massive scale and high availability, right? So think 80,000 or 100,000 projects, you need to be consuming millions of S-bombs, let's say. And what do you do in such a scenario where you want to do triaging, like we just saw before where you suppress a vulnerability? That's pretty manual, right? How do you do that for uh, in scale? So dependency track uh, Hades has uh, two really cool features called um, vulnerability policy and also integrity analysis. And we'll be seeing that right now. 
So integrity analysis is basically um, figuring out whether a package is not who they say they are. Uh, it compares the hash of the project, of the component, um, from the SBAR against the artifact repository. And you can see that, uh, is this package undergoing package spoofing? Um, maybe it is a potential malicious component. You, you should check it out. And you can see the hashes on the component itself. If you go inside and check out the details, these hashes are compared with the one from, say, Maven Central or PyPy, right? And the next feature is the vulnerability policy, which helps uh, triage uh, automatically uh, vulnerabilities in your system. So remember, we saw a component that had a vulnerability, and we suppressed it manually. Here, you can create a complex uh, vulnerability policy using common expression language, cell, and it essentially says, if you have a CVE ID and it is from the library called JXPath, if the library JXPath is a transitive of Spring Framework, then it is not uh, something you should be worried about, so you can suppress it, right? So here to the right, uh, there is an option to say that this analysis should be suppressed. The reason is the code is not reachable, and you can set the state as not affected. And this can really help uh, improve your time to triage uh, multiple issues across your portfolio. Let's go see a demo of that. So we have this vulnerability policy set up, right? And it can you can even specify the version of your top-level hierarchy. And once you go upload as, as upload an SBOM, the policy is kicked in automatically. So we are uploading an SBOM here, and this SBOM has JXPath as a transitive dependency of Spring Framework Cloud. So as soon as you go to the audit vulnerabilities page, you can see that onto the right, JXPath is marked as suppressed, and it is automatically uh, contained here in the audit vulnerabilities page with all the information needed on why this vulnerability was uh, suppressed. So this is a very powerful feature. The same cell policy that was uh, used to make this policy, you can write your other um, policies using cell as well in Hades, such as uh, the one we saw for package age or any fields that are available uh, exposed in dependency track, you could add it as a cell uh, policy. And it's a very uh, powerful tool where you don't have to wait on people to manually triage stuff, right? It's, it, especially in, in, in the cases of you having like millions or tens of thousands of software bill of materials in your project. So I guess that is my time. Um, please feel free to join our community. We are very active on Slack. There's uh, every month there are meetings, community meetings that happen. It's a good place to know uh, what's happening in dependency track. Uh, you could uh, ask questions to the maintainers. And uh, we're also uploading the community meetings onto YouTube. Uh, the project is open source, of course. It's in GitHub. So uh, looking forward to uh, many users and uh, possible contributors here. So yeah, thank you so much for coming to my talk. Thanks.